I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about the class list element, CSS frameworks, animation, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have a blog post over on the HTML5 Doctor website about the class list API in JavaScript. Now, prior to the class list API, if you wanted to get a list of classes that an element had, well, there's a whole bunch of JavaScript that was involved. Uh, and you know, plugins like jQuery would make this a little bit easier to work with. However, now we have the class list API. And it's absolutely wonderful. If you want to get a list of class names that an element has, you just say document.getElementById and then say class list on that variable. Now this gives you an array. Um, in this example, it says it's got four different class names, O, oh, My, Giddy, and Ant. And then you can actually get a JavaScript object out of this. Now, there is an API that you can use once you have the list of classes. You can add to it, remove, see if it contains, toggle, um, just a few different things here. Uh, I'm really, really happy to see the class list API because really this was just a ton of hacks that you had to use previously. Anyway, go ahead and check out this blog post for more information. It's definitely worth the read. Very cool stuff. Well, next up, we've got animated books with CSS 3D transforms over on the Code Drops blog. Now, I know what you're thinking. Animated books? Whoa, that's whoa. way better than paper. Well, it's not quite what you're thinking. Uh, that's what I'm thinking exactly. But if we <laughs> get out of my head, Nick. If we check this out, uh, you can see that when I hover over each one of these books, it actually opens up and allows you to click a download link. So it provides kind of a traditional feel for books uh, that maybe are actually ebooks, and you would just download them on the internet. They also have an example of paperback books that do a very similar thing. So you can hover over these and maybe download them or see a preview and so on. If we go to the Code Drops article and scroll down here, we will see right away that support in Internet Explorer is a little bit questionable. I haven't looked, but I'm assuming that's because Preserve 3D is not really supported there. But it's a cool example nonetheless. The way that they're constructing the 3D object is by using pseudo elements to provide a little bit of uh, a little bit of thickness to each one of these covers and pages, and then they use transitions or I'm sorry, yes, transitions and transforms. And if we scroll down here a little bit more, you can see that they're using the nth child pseudo selector on each one of the pages, which are actually in the form of a list. And they just delay each page by a little bit to give that nice smooth opening effect where a few of the pages kind of flutter past. Pretty cool stuff. I'm actually very impressed by this. And I'm also impressed by just how little code you need to actually do that. Yeah, Pretty cool stuff. The demo is really impressive. I'd like to campaign for getting the cliff notes when you hover over the book element. That's a good idea. Yeah, Sa save me some time. Always thinking. Yeah, always looking for a TLDR. Next up, we have a quick blog post on animated GIFs the hard way. Now, um, this is really interesting. This guy was designing the website for Sublime Text 2.0, and he actually wanted to demonstrate the features via an animated GIF on the site. Uh, but instead, he wound up doing something pretty amazing. Uh, he took a series of PNG screenshots, which he wanted to display, and wrote an encoder, which just takes the metadata of the differences between these PNGs and then displays it in the browser. That is amazing. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. Um, it actually saves um, a lot of space when creating these animated GIFs. Uh, the GIF was one meg in animation, and this is a lot less than that. Uh, so you can see the animation is pretty smooth right here. Uh, not really uh, jagged at all. Not choppy either. Uh, and this is all packed into one single PNG file. So this is 96K instead of one meg. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. The metadata looks like this. It has a timeline with the delay and what parts of the image need to be changed. And you can actually download the encoder. 
he has a link to his GitHub account here where he has the animation encoder. And then you just run it with a directory that contains all the different images you want and then you are good to go. Uh, this is really interesting. A long time ago on the Treehouse Show, Nick, we were uh, dissecting the Apple website and the, how they were doing the animation image for the iPhone. And they used a very similar technique. Yeah, exactly. So now we have an open source version of that which you can check out. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, next up is Topcoat, which is basically a CSS framework that evolved from the design language used by Adobe in products like Edge and Brackets. So here you can see a couple of examples of what Topcoat looks like on various devices. So it's, of course, responsive. And if we click on the usage guidelines here, you can see a whole ton of examples as to what top coat actually looks like. And it's a pretty nice style. It's kind of a dark theme, which you don't see terribly often, but Adobe has adopted in their, uh, in their suite of image editing and video editing applications, probably because you're able to focus on your content a little bit easier. But I kind of like it. And they use some very common design patterns, such as the three line bar you see here that is used all over the internet and across many different websites. Uh, the thing that I think I really like about Topcoat is that it's very performance focused, which as we've discussed in past episodes is very important, particularly in mobile web applications. So not a whole lot to say about it, but it's just a really nice CSS framework and I highly recommend you check it out. Very, very cool. I really like the name too. It's very dignified, Topcoat. Yes. yes, it is. Uh, next up, we have a project called Kinetic JS. This is billed as Enterprise Class Interactive Web Graphics. So this is going to be another library that's going to be really useful for creating games and really rich graphics on the web. Or going into outer space since it's enterprise ready. Oh, there you go. Engage. So. Um, it supports a ton of stuff. It works with HTML5, Canvas, and JavaScript, so you get high-performance web animations, transitions, node nesting, layering, filtering, caching, event handling for desktop and mobile applications, and much, much more. Wow, I just said all of that. So let's just see an example. Let's see what you can do. This is a game called Humans, Aliens, and Robots. I'm just going to click the Go button, and look at that. Guest1375 has joined the fray. Wow, that's amazing. Isn't it? Careful, Jason, you're wearing a red shirt. <laughs> I know, you I know. You might not make it out. So, um, yeah, there's, there's not, uh, I, I have no idea how this game works, but you can see the graphics are really, really smooth so far. And uh, I, I can zoom in and out, and it's actually pretty performant. Um, but, anyway, there's a, there's a ton of different demos that you can see here, and it's really, really interesting to see how it works. So, basically, you get a stage, which is composed of layers, and from these layers, you can add groups of images or shapes or something like that. Uh, once you get there, there is a very, very rich API that you can use to interact with all of these different elements and remain performant while you're creating these web applications. Uh, I really, really recommend checking this out and just viewing the whole library. There's great documentation on there. You can find that in the show notes at youtube.com slash gotreehouse or search for us in iTunes at The Treehouse Show. Pretty nifty stuff. Well, have you ever been on, say, Amazon.com yes. or really any website where you're buying something and you're typing in your credit card information? Usually it's kind of a hassle and occasionally you'll come across a good example where it's like, wow, I can just type in my credit card number and it knows what type of credit card I have and this looks really good. Well, Enter Skewo card, which actually is a return to skewmorphism, of course, the Skewmorphism is a way of designing things so that, it, that they look like their real-world equivalents. So with Skewo card, when I go ahead and type in a credit card number here, they give an example of a couple different popular credit cards. I'll go ahead and type in a Visa card. Hey, look at that. It knows that I'm using a Visa. I'll go ahead and type in the expiration date here, and I'll type in my name and then I can click here to flip to the other side and fill out other information. So I can fill out, say, the security code here, and then I'm all done. This is way different than any other credit card I've ever seen, and I think it's actually an excellent use of skewmorphism because 
it looks exactly like your credit card and it's really easy to find where those numbers are so that you know when you have to explain when the where the uh, security code is on the card you don't have to go into this really long explanation you can just say hey it's on the back of your card right here just like it looks like in the in the web form so pretty cool stuff you can go ahead and download the code and check it out I usually, if I want to order something, just take a picture of my credit card and post it to Twitter or Facebook and ask somebody to order it for me. And then, you know, a few extra things might come in the mail too. Yeah, then you don't even have to worry about, you know, if it looks like my card on the website. That's a good tip. Yeah. Heard it here first, people. Next up, Alex McCaw has a great blog post on cross-site request forgery in JavaScript web applications. Now, cross-site request forgery is something that would let an attacker to the website simulate a request to another website as if it was coming from an individually logged in user. An example of this, say embedding an image tag in a document that is not on uh, your website that contains you know, maybe some code or something that would go off and fire a request on another web application on behalf of that user. So there's different ways to protect against this. And one of the ways is to implement something called a CRF token. And what that will do, that's just this token that's specific to that request. Uh, it's usually a series of uh, letters and numbers. And that will let your web server know that the request came from who it was intended for. So one really neat way to do this using AJAX uh, for AJAX web applications is something called the AJAX pre-filter. And you can pass this token to your JavaScript application and then automatically add that to jQuery's XHR request right in JavaScript. And then you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the request. You don't have to go through each individual AJAX call and add it. So there's a quick bit of code that I recommend checking out. It's right here on the blog and you can find that in the show notes. Nice. Well, next up is animate.css. This is basically just a collection of CSS animations, which if you were to put these together on your own, might be a little bit tricky to actually do all of these effectively or maybe in the best way. This has already done all the work for you. Wonderful. So if we go ahead and scroll down, there's a couple attention seekers here. So we can click on these. <laughs> it will actually flash this or... Do a little ta-da, apparently that's what a ta-da looks like. It'll wobble it, it can uh, pulse it. There we go. There's a ton of other examples here. Uh, let's see what light speed in looks like. Whoa! Whoa! That's amazing. Slow down. That's even better than the Enterprise. Here you can uh, hinge stuff, you can roll it in and out. It's used by a couple of popular companies that you may have heard of and Really, you know, not a whole lot to say about it, but again, putting together CSS animations like this can be pretty tedious, time consuming. You'll end up doing a lot of experiment. Work. Yeah, work. <laughs> Who likes that? No, you end up doing a lot of experimentation and just changing numbers around and moving back and forth and trying out different stuff when these animations already look great and you can go ahead and just drop them right into your website. So definitely check that one out. Very cool. Well, who are you on Twitter? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cypher. If you want more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us in iTunes at The Treehouse Show. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next week.